For chapter 10, there's not a whole heck of a lot. It's the first few pages, okay? So I want to quick go through that because we also have to cover chapter 5 today. I know you believe it. So basically, when you look in your textbook, you are going to see muscle actions. There's a focus on page 321. You're going to see another figure, 10.2, patterns of fascicle arrangements in muscles. And these should help you with understanding why muscles have their names. They are named for many different reasons. Either the action they create, that might be part of their name, or their origin and insertions, that might be part of their name, or the arrangement of their fascicles, that might be part of their name. So understanding these terms is going to help you understand and remember where these muscles are. Okay? So quick, muscle tissue, contractile, three different kinds, skeletal, cardiac, smooth. We know all that from tissues. So what are they, when we talk about skeletal muscle, what's it for? Moving your skeleton. So some of the criteria for naming might be some of the things that I just mentioned. And in your textbook, they talk about that on page 320, under naming of skeletal muscles. So muscles can only pull. What's that mean? Yeah, because we talked about the physiology of muscle in the previous chapter, you understand that a cell can do this. That's it. Only that, nothing else. Yes? So when we, yeah? Correct. That's all they can do. Okay. That's all they can do. That's why you have over 600 muscles. Because when I do this, it's not just, is it? It's going to be pulled from a whole bunch of different sides to create that movement. So we see a lot more muscles associated with the skeleton because we can create all of these different movements. Yes? So the work of muscles together is going to create all of these movements. So you can't, that's all a muscle can do is shorten and lengthen. So, there's different groups of muscles, different players in any movement, let's say, when we talk about functional muscle groups. The prime mover for this movement is the which muscle? The, the one, no, the prime, yeah, agonist, not antagonist. Yeah, the other one. Forget, they're kind of close, so don't put the T in there because that's the other one. That's the one responsible for producing the specific movement. This movement, who's responsible? That guy, the biceps brachii, yes? Okay. The other guy, also important in this movement, is the antagonist. So we have an agonist or prime mover and an antagonist that kind of does the opposite, but if it didn't do the opposite, you wouldn't be able to do the move, right? Who's that? These guys here, what's happening? They're lengthening. So they are antagonists. They do the opposite. They oppose that movement. If they didn't do that, you wouldn't be able to move that. Tetanus causes muscles to contract, period. It's not going to allow your muscles to relax. That's an issue for your diaphragm, for example. You know, because you kind of have to contract and relax to breathe. That's an issue for your heart, kind of. Yeah? Because I can squeeze everything out, but then if I can't relax to let everything what? Fill back up, yeah, you're kind of screwed. Yes? So see the problem with tetanus? Okay. So 
Prime mover, know these terms. This is basically all you need to know from this chapter. Synergist, what's a synergist? Somebody that's gonna help with the movement. So there's a bunch of muscles here and here and there's some down here and here for that movement. They're gonna help work together with the prime mover to create a nice fluid movement and reduce any jigging around that that movement might create if it only had a prime mover and an antagonist. Smooth it out. Hmm? It's a stabilizer. The other guy in this same slide, the fixator, is going to help keep everything stable by creating a point that doesn't move. So it's the immobilizing bone, a place that's going to hold everything steady to pull off of. So with this movement, who's the fixator? Yeah, these guys up here, holding my shoulder steady while these guys move down here. Yes? Make sense? Understand these terms. So, fixator is going to give that prime mover a base on which to act, something that holds steady so I can pull off of it. Understand this diagram and some of the actions. You know them already. When did you learn them? They were in lab. We did it when we discussed joints. Yes? Synovial joints. All those different movements, way back when, when we did bones, you know these. These are the muscles associated with those actions. So, muscles can be prime movers for one movement, antagonists for one other movement, and a synergist for a third movement. They can all be all three, depending on what the movement is. The other thing, criteria used for muscle naming. All muscles can be that. All three. Uh, now, you, now you're going to put me on the spot. But as far as I know, I think so. Maybe there's some that might not be all three, depending on the movement. But I can't think of any on, off the top of my head. Maybe some of the, um, some of the muscles in the cranium, because there's so few, especially over the cranium, maybe some of those guys, but. Muscle location, where it is. Temporalis, guess. Yeah, temporal bone. So named for the bone that they lie over. Shape, deltoid. Yes, where is it? So it's shape, that's what it got its name for, triangle. Size, big, medium, little, maximus, medius, minimus. Yes? Not just one, three. Big one on the outside, gluteus what? Maximus, underneath, medius, under that, minimus. So that is made up of three, yes? And they're named for the size. So, maximus, medius, minimus. And then the directions in which the fascicles go. Now, remember, I can make all these weird movements. I just don't go, e e e e yes? In order to do that, I have to pull from many different directions. You know what a fascicle is, right? Okay, so we can have fascicles that go in different directions so that I can create these movements. So rectus, fibers that go straight. Transversus, fibers that go at an angle. Oblique, fibers that run along an imaginary defined axis. So that might be part of your muscles as well. Rectus abdominis, where are they? In the abdominal region. And how do the fibers run? Straight up and down. That's why this region is such a pain in the keister. Because guess what? We don't just have those guys. We have transversus and we also have obliques that run in different directions as well. So when you're trying to tone that wonderful region that all of us love so much, you know, trying to get that six pack, I myself have a case, a keg, a keg. 
I like to refer to it as a case. Because there's several regions. I, they, each of them have my children's names. Yes. Um, but that's why that's such a pain, because all of those muscles, different muscle groups running in different directions. So when you want to exercise that, you can't just do sit-ups, can you? You have to do a whole bunch of other things to get all of those other fibers exercised as well. Uh, the number of origins, biceps has, triceps has, good. Location and attachment, where the origin and insertion might be, might be part of the name, okay? What's an origin? It's where the muscle attaches to an immovable portion. So that same biceps origin is up here in the shoulder region, yes? What's an insertion? The other side, where that muscle pulls on something and causes it to move. Muscle action, extensors, flexors, abductors, adductors. You know those terms already, right? So, extensor carpi radialis longus. Guess, where is it? Yeah. Okay? So when you have to go identify these muscles in lab, remember this. Because if you see it and you're like, I have no flipping idea where that is, if you see this word, where are you going to go? Go to, that, go to that region and see if there's a label there for you. Okay? So use the word to your advantage. Understand the terminology. So, additional factors that contribute to muscle speed, force, is the way their fascicles are arranged. And then we're going to talk about something called the lever system. So, on page 322, no, figure 10.2, all of those different patterns of fascicle arrangement. Those are going to play a role in how that muscle moves. <clears throat> so, we can have circular... We can have convergent coming together around in a circle. Most of the um, most common patterns, circular, convergent, parallel, fusiform, and pennate. Parallel and fusiform. Again, self-explanatory. Look at the diagram. Understand these terms. Arrangement of fascicle. Yes? That's going to determine the muscle's range of motion. Yes? Depends on the muscles and the fascicles, the way they're arranged and how they're pulling. So again, I don't have to, I'm not, I'm not going to go through this. This is, this is self-explanatory, hopefully, at this point in your AMP career. Um, what I do want you to understand and be able to visually identify is the different classes in our lever system in this. So there's three different classes according to your textbook of lever systems. What's a lever system? It's a physics thing. Exactly. So basically it's a physics thing that talks about the amount of force needed in order for you to overcome a load. In layman's terms, how strong do I have to be to pick something up? And all of these movements have three basic components. In a lever system, you have the lever. And that's like the solid, rigid bar. Let's think about a seesaw. That's a lever system, believe it or not. So what's the lever in the seesaw? Yeah, the board that you sit on, right? So it's some rigid part. In the case of you and your movements, it's a bone that moves on some sort of fixed thing. When we talk about the seesaw, what's the fixed thing? It's called the fulcrum, but what is it? Yeah, it's the little base that the, the board sits on. With movements, that fulcrum or that fixed point is some sort of joint, usually. Not necessarily, no. Actually, no. Effort. 
What's that? How much energy? So go back to the seesaw. How much energy I need to move a load? So it's the force I need, and that's going to be supplied by your muscle contraction, to move something with the help of the lever and the fulcrum. So back to the seesaw. We have two loads, yes? There's a little kid that sits on one end. Actually, let's put a really big kid on that end. And then a little kid on the other end. Is the seesaw going anywhere? No. How come? Speak physics to me. Why? Speak physics to me. Correct. The effort cannot overcome the load. Yes? You with me? That's a lever system. So the load is what I want to move, resistance, bone, tissue, and any other added weight that I have to overcome with my effort. You with me? You just learned physics. That wasn't so bad, was it? So lever systems and the way they're set up, if I can place the fulcrum and the effort and the load in certain places, I can allow for more load movement. So there's a mechanical advantage to setting things up in a certain way. Load close to the fulcrum, effort far from the fulcrum, small effort can move large load. Anybody ever use a wheelbarrow? Try and pick all that crap up you pick up with a wheelbarrow without the wheelbarrow. You ever use a jack on your car? Simple machine based on the lever system. Try to pick up the car without it. Not happening, right? So the placement of all of these things in a lever system gives you an advantage. Sometimes there's a disadvantage if they're placed too far apart from each other. So this is, in physics, how we describe a lever system. I'm not going to make you know numbers. I don't care about the numbers. I want you to realize the difference between a first, a second, and a third class lever system and where the effort, the fulcrum, and the lever is placed in those systems. Okay? So this is the math behind these simple machines and why they can lift a larger load with the help of them. So if too far away the load from all of the other guys, that could be a disadvantage. You ever try to shovel snow? <laughs> you live in Maine, so probably all of you have. Yes? All right, what happens when you put too much snow on the shovel at the end? So yeah, sometimes you can't because it's too far away. What's a better shovel to use to shovel snow? Big, long shovel or a shorter shovel? How come? Yeah, the load is closer to the effort, and the fulcrum is more effective. So if you get a big, long shovel like you use for the garden or something else, that's not so good for shoveling snow. Make a, make a, make a sense? I just got an Italian accent. So principles of the lever system are as follows. Effort farther from the load, from the fulcrum, has to do with all the math and physics stuff. Effort nearer to the load to the fulcrum operates at a disadvantage. And then you need to recognize three different lever classes. First class, and we see these on page five, uh, uh, 325 in your textbook, figure 10.4, the first class lever system. That's the seesaw we just described. So the fulcrum is between the load and the effort. So the fulcrum is between the load and the effort. So the kids on the seesaw are either the load or the effort, correct? A scissor is a first class lever system. And when we look at your body, here's an example of a first class lever system. Now 
What, when you're on a seesaw, what do you do to move? If you're exactly the same size, what would you do to move? You'd have to push off to the ground to increase your what? Effort so you could overcome your load. The other kid, once he gets the ground, is going to do the same thing. Exactly. So this is an example in your body. Second class lever system. Load is between the fulcrum and the effort. That wheelbarrow we just talked about, that's an example of a second class lever system. So the fulcrum's on the end, the load is in the middle, and the effort is on the opposite end. Your example in the body. Yes? And third class lever system. Effort applied between the fulcrum and the load. Tweezers is an example of a third class lever system. So we have the fulcrum at one end, the effort in the middle, and the load at the opposite end. Effort in that movement I keep using with the biceps flexing the forearm. We good? More than 600 muscles in your body. And they're grouped by functional location. We already talked about this. Shape, where the muscle is, origin, insertion, actions, innervation. That's what they pull on. So the rest, lab. Know that. Know that. Yep. Yes. Okay? So in lab, and those of you who have lab today, make sure you spend some time. You're going to look at a bunch of slides and then, you know, you're free. But take some time to go over these. Take some time to maybe visit interactive physiology. Know those. Pull out your clicker. Correct. Pretty much. Except like deltoid, it tells you the shape, but it doesn't really tell you where it is. You have to kind of know where it is. So the muscle that provides the major force for producing a specific movement. And it's, of course, A, B, C, and D. to hit it. You could conclude that a muscle with the term rectus included in its name is a muscle whose fibers run what to the body's vertical axis. Sir. Thank you. Oh, parallel. We just went over that, guys. Where does it show it? It's in the um, terms, directional terms. Uh, see it, page what? The one you highlighted and underlined. Okay, 
Okay, so let's go to chapter five. Everybody understands what's going to happen on Thursday, correct? What? What? You have a test. <laughs> yep. You have an exam on chapters what? Nine, ten, and five. So what is that? We're in the integumentary system. Another name for it is your cutaneous membrane. Your skin. Two parts, two major parts. Epithelial cells on the outside. What do we call that part? The epidermis. And then underneath connective tissue and a whole bunch of other crap? Dermis. Underneath that? Underneath that? Hypodermis or subcutaneous. What's in the hypodermis? So helps keep you toasty. Adipose tissue. Okay? So the skin is composed of those major parts. Epidermis. We're going to find a whole bunch of good stuff. A bunch of epithelial cells. What kind of epithelial cells? Stratified squamous epithelium, which means what? Many layers. Many layers of flat cells with. Thank you. Basement membrane and connective tissue underneath. What do we call the connective tissue underneath? Dermis. Yes? Okay. Five layers in thick skin of cells in the epithelial portion of the cutaneous membrane. Keratinocytes. What's keratin? It's a waterproofer. So that when you jump in the water, you don't whoop, blow up like the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. Because that's what would happen if you didn't have a waterproofer. Yes? And sometimes when you hang in the tub a little bit too long, it starts happening. That's why you get all wrinkly. So these cells are referred to as keratinocytes because they contain this substance, keratin, a waterproofer. Another thing we're going to find in the epidermis, and that's the epithelial layer, is some cells at the base that are going to help make chemicals that these cells contain as well. Yes. The keratin's inside the cells. What you saw on the outside was the dead layer kind of sloughing off. And that's what happens with a layer of keratinocytes. In a stratified squamous epithelial layer that doesn't have keratin, all those cells will lay down smooth. So when I look at your esophagus versus your skin, I'm going to see a difference. Keratinized skin non-keratinized esophagus. Make sense? Oh, yeah. So when you look in lab today, you're going to look at those again. So you're going to look at the keratinized stuff, stratified squamous, and then you're going to have a peek at the esophagus and see the difference between the two. Yes? Another thing we're going to find down here at the bottom is something called a melanocyte. Anybody knows what anybody, anybody know what that thing does for a living? It makes a pigment called melanin. And melanin protects your genetic material from UV rays. Some of us have lots. Some of us have little. It's genetic. Skin color is dependent on three alleles. This is, you don't have to write this down. Two pairs of alleles. This is genetics. You have six bits of information that's going to determine what your, six, your skin color is. Where do you get that six bits of information from? You get three bits of it from your mother. You get three bits of it from your father. They are going to combine and determine the intensity of the amount of melanin that you produce and put into your cells. So those melanocytes way down here in this diagram produce melanin. And that's what these little black dots are in the diagram. Your cells are going to 
engulf those little packages of melanin produced by the melanocytes down here. And then those little packages are sort of going to surround your nucleus as the cells move up for protection. How come my skin gets darker when it's exposed to sun? Does everybody get darker when they're exposed to sun? Yes. 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 Everyone even a very dark-skinned person, will get darker when exposed to the sun. Dark skin is much better for UV protection. So where do we see more dark-skinned people typically originating from on this planet? They tend to have more dark-skinned people closer to more intense sunlight. And that seems to be the origin of that triple dose of melanin producing. So everybody's sort of a combination in between. Now why is that, though? Why do you think? Well, dark colors drop. So why would you want to be darker? Yeah. You know, it draws heat. We're not, we're not talking about drawing heat. We're talking about who? Sort of like protection. That. We're talking about protecting our genetic material. That's like, it's like an umbrella around the genetic material. So the bigger my umbrella, the more protection I get. Unfortunately, it also happens to absorb heat, but that's not gonna, that's not gonna worry me too much. It's the protection from those UV rays that that provides me. Make sense? Okay. So, difference between a dark-skinned person and a light-skinned person, that's it. Melanin. That's all. You make more melanin, the darker your skin is. Lighter skin person makes less melanin. That's all. The other thing we're going to find in the epidermis, besides those melanocytes, we are going to find other cells that are going to help protect us from the outside world. Remember, the cutaneous system is covering the outside of you. Yes? So we have dendritic cells, part of the nervous system. We talked about some of these guys. Um, encapsulated dendritic cells, remember that? Tactile. So we see those in the lower layers of the epidermis as well. So the epidermis has five layers in thick skin. In thin skin, only four. Are you going to have to know them? Yes, you are. At the bottom, stratum basal. And this is where the cells are born. These cells have intact genetic material and they are replicating at a rapid rate. And they are then pushing their way up to the surface as they replicate. No, no vascular anywhere. Remember, epithelial cells are avascular. Where's the vascular? in the dermis. So when you cut yourself, and you've all done this at one time or another, sometimes you scrape yourself and you don't bleed, where do you think you just pulled off? Just the epidermis. If you go lower than that and you start bleeding, you went into the dermis. That's where your blood vessels are. So, right, melanin granules. Melanocytes, lots of desmosomes to hold everybody together. Everybody knows what a desmosome is, right? What is it? What's a desmosome? Yeah, it's like a spot weld. Good. It's one of those cellular junctions that hold cells tight together. That's a good thing because it's kind of covering everything on the outside, it's protecting from the outside. So. Stratum basal, deepest layer, closest to the dermis. This is where the cells are born. The epithelial cells are born in the stratum basal, and then they move up. As they move up, we're going to see keratin production in the stratum spinosum. The cells are called stratum spinosum because they actually start to kind of look spiny almost and rough around the edges. 
You can see that in the um, histology slide over there. As they move further up, stratum granulosum is the next layer. They're called granulosum because those melanin bundles start to become very prominent. The next layer, not on this diagram, in thick skin, is the stratum lucidum. The stratum lucidum we find in thick skin. Where's thick skin? Yeah, bottom of your feet. And some of you, some of you don't have it because you're a little on the lazy side. But feel at the bottom of each of your fingers. You feel that? Some of you don't feel it. Some of you do. Yeah, little callousy places like that. Places that get, get a lot of friction. Stratum lucidum. What happens to the cells is they start to become almost clear. What's happening to these cells as they move away from their food source way down there in the dermis? They're going to start to die. And last but not least, we have 30, 20 to 30 layers of cells in the last layer, the furthest away from the dermis, called the stratum corneum. These are definitely dead as a doornail at this point and constantly sloughing off. So every time I go like this, all my cells are falling to the ground. You know dust in your house? You know what it's made of? Yeah, your cells. That and little dust mites that like to eat them. So when you dust, you're dusting up your dead stratum corneum cells and the little dust mites that are enjoying them. Mm. Yes? It makes you want to go home and dust, doesn't it? All right, so know the five layers. Again, stratum lucidum. We don't see it on this diagram because this probably is a diagram of what? Thinner skin. When we talk about the dermis, the dermis is underneath the epidermis. The dermis and the epidermis meet. It's not flat when they meet, is it? You know those little uh, egg crate cushions you see in some nursing homes and some other places? You might even have one yourself on top of your mattress if your mattress is as old as mine. The little egg crate things. You know what I'm talking about? Everybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, take that and fold it in half. That's how your skin comes together, epidermis, dermis. So you can see the little egg crate fingers here. This is dermis, this is epidermis. And that's called the papillary layer. So that's where the epidermis meets the dermis. The reticular layer of the dermis, why do you think we call it reticular layer? Because <laughs> it's a lot more reticular fibers reticular connective tissue down lower in the dermis. So the papillary layer meets the epidermis of the dermis and the reticular layer is down lower near the hypodermis or subcutaneous. Yes? yes. All right. Because of this fact, when your skin, your epidermis grows, it's not flat, is it? Look at your hands. You got a bunch of what? Lines, yes? Dermatoglyphics, because of the fact that this does not grow flat. You have these all over your body. They can become more pronounced when you age because your connective tissue starts to lose some of its tight fibrousness. Yes? But they're there even when you're young. They're just not as pronounced. Cleavage lines in the reticular dermis can be seen here in this diagram. And those friction ridges, what are they for? Yeah, they help you pick things up. Okay? So, papillary layer, reticular layer, and those little lines that we see causing those little bumps. Now, in some areas of your skin, some of the other parts of your dermis are going to secrete product out to the surface of your skin. And we see here sweat 
glands. And we'll also talk about other glands like sudoriferous glands. So where I get a lot of bending, I'm going to see lines more pronounced. Those are called flexure lines. And then, of course, our dermatoglyphics in our fingers. So the next thing they talk about in the book is skin color. So again, we know that skin color, one of the things that contributes to skin color is melanin. The more melanin I make, the darker my skin. Sometimes we have problems with melanin production. Sometimes we have problems with melanin production in skin derivatives. What's a skin derivative? What comes out of the skin? Hair. What else? Nails. Those are skin derivatives. They're also discussed in this book. The color associated with that also comes from what? Melanocytes. Yes? This is a diagram of some of the derivatives or appendages of the skin. So the other thing before we get there that contributes to the color of your skin is not just melanin, but also a couple of other pigments you might be surprised to find out about. One, hemoglobin. That happens to me, well, I have a condition called rosacea, so I'm always bright red. But sometimes when you get embarrassed, why? Yeah, your blood vessels may dilate. Yes? will come closer to the surface and show more of that hemoglobin pigment, that reddish color. When your blood vessels constrict, they move further away from the surface of the skin and you get less of that hemoglobin color. You with me? If you're anemic, boy, you look white. You look pale. Yes? How come? Not as much hemoglobin less red in your skin. The other one, carotene. Where does carotene come from? Carrots. Carotene comes from carrots, tomatoes, color, vegetables of color, oranges, reds. Okay, they are also going to contribute to skin color as well. Sometimes I can have a buildup of waste products that contributes to even more of that pigment uh, when patients have problems with liver and liver metabolism. When we talk about the digestive system, we'll talk about this. They can have a buildup of something called bilirubin in their system. And they can actually appear to be what? Yellow. The whites of their eyes will turn yellow because of this pigment building up in their blood plasma. Hmm? Whose disease? One of the one of the manifestations of yes, but uh, jaundice is is the is the umbrella of the description of that particular condition. It, it, well, and now I'm probably dating myself, but I, one of my favorite shows that I used to show my kids when they were little, Magic School Bus. Did you love the Magic School Bus? Did you want to be in Miss Frizzle's class? Yeah, I did. But there was one with Ralphie, and he ate all of these orange snacky things, and she did the integumentary system there. You were learning anatomy way back then, when, do you believe it or not? And Ralphie turned orange because of the increase of those orange pigments in his skin. So, all right, so keep that in mind. Appendages, so under homeostatic imbalances, they talk about problems with UV light. Um, people that don't make these pigments, enough of these pigments have problems with protecting themselves from UV light. Yes? What's albinism? Yeah, lack of your melanocytes not being able to make this pigment. So we have very light, light skin. And what other 
things, the melanocytes, or what else are they responsible for making pigment in? Hair, nails, iris, the color in your eyes. So we see people with true albinism having pink irises because there's no pigment there from the melanin production. All right, appendages of skin, hair, nails. So hair grows the same way as the epidermis does. It's an epidermal derivative. Hair is alive down here at the root. So if I grab one of my hairs and I pull it out, ouch, I got a couple more. And I look at the end, what does it look like? It's kind of chubby at the end. Oh, that's nasty. Little skin tag, right? That's what the CSI people like. Why do they like that? That's chock full of live cells. So when I rip that out like that, I'm going to get some of this and all of these nice live cells here. So this is like the stratum basal of your hair. Born down in the matrix, you have cells that are constantly reproducing themselves and pushing their way out. So if I follow my hair down to the other end, that hair shaft, that's all dead stuff. So if I get that at the crime scene, is that going to do me much good? No, usually don't have any luck getting any good DNA from that. So understand how a hair grows. Again, we have those same melanocytes way down there at the base where we see the papilla of the hair that kind of holds it in where growth begins. <coughs> those cells will produce pigment. The cells that are growing above it will engulf that pigment and grow up. Now. What happens when my hair starts losing pigment? Do you ever hear, you know, and some of you blonde women, you've probably heard this, that, that little airhead joke? No. Blonde women are not airheads. Blonde people are not airheads. Who's the true airhead? Gray. Gray. Why? Because instead of spitting out little packages of melanin at some point in your life, we're going to get tired of doing that in the hair shaft. And instead of spitting out packages of melanin, we're going to start spitting out air bubbles. Yeah, it kind of spreads throughout the scalp, yeah. It's a chemistry thing. So you ever get that gray hair? It's kind of like doesn't hang with the rest of the other ones, does it? It's kind of like <coughs> you understand? It's coarser, right? Why? It's full of air bubbles. So the airhead is truly the one with gray hair, not the one with blonde hair. Don't you feel much better? No, I don't have any gray hair that you can tell. So, melanocytes create the pigment for hair as well. They grow from the base, understand the structure of hair growing at the cuticle and moving its way up into the shaft. We good? When you go into lab, I want you to pay attention to those slides. I want you to look very closely at the scalp because I want you to also find some other things associated with hair follicles. The next thing they talk about is types of hair growth. We have thicker hair on the tops. In places where we sort of have to keep warm in humans is where we find thicker hair. So more thick hair exposed to the elements. Um, hair is also a secondary sex characteristic in males. So hairy, bushy makes me look what? Bigger. Yes? My dog, when she gets really, something's outside, I'm going to go get it. What happens to the hair on the back of her? Whoosh. Yeah, with the help of the erector pili muscle, the hair on the back of her neck stands up. Oh, wait a minute. What am I doing? Why did dogs do that? <laughs> to make themselves look bigger. 
So that little muscle over there, the erector pili muscle, associated with all your hair follicles in some animals is going to help them control their environment. So, hair. Thinning hair and baldness. Problems with some of the chemicals associated with production of cells at the hair follicle. Not all your hair follicles are active all the time. And you know that because I bet you a lot of you this morning, well, some of you know, when they brush their hair, what happened? You shed all over the place. What, what are you shedding? That's where, <laughs> where it starts and then it just goes downhill from there. So some of your hair follicles, and you have so many of them on, the, on your head, for example, sort of take a break. Hair falls out, you get rid of old ones. They take a break, then they kick in after a little while. Somebody else takes a break. So not all of them are active all the time. <coughs> Some of them stay on a permanent vacation. And that has to do with a chemical called DHT and hair production in the hair follicle. Um, if you can, you would be a rich, rich person. Because we're constantly trying to figure out how to do that, right? Yes. Yep. Definitely. And, and it also has to do with the rate of skin growth as well. So we'll see at different, different times of the year, skin growth seems to be faster than other times of the year. <clears throat> also, uh, friction can... Faster when it's warmer? Mm, sometimes it's actually slower when it's warmer and faster when it's cold, depending on the individual. Your, your erector pili muscle pulls on the hair shaft. It doesn't grow. It kind of sticks up further. It's more prominent. So say I was no erector pili muscle. I'm just going to kind of lay there for a while. But when I pull on it, it makes it stick up and be more prominent. So the dog's hair doesn't grow. It's just sticking up and making the dog look larger. And that's what happens when you get goosebumps your hairs kind of stick up <clears throat> and become more prominent because your muscle contraction is trying to produce more heat for you. So why would uh, like a thyroid medicine make you lose hair? It has to do with the chemical balance associated with hair growth. So that can disrupt some of the hormones associated with hair growth. And there's other hormones besides DHT, also um, uh, testosterone and estrogen can have an effect on hair growth as well. So when we discuss the endocrine system, we'll see a lot of the secondary things that hormones might do as well. Some, um, sometimes, uh, and I don't know if anybody's experienced this, after a pregnancy, women can lose quite a bit of hair trying to balance the hormones after pregnancy. Um, uh, alopecia can also be caused by different hormone imbalances. Uh, I think they talk about that. Someplace in here. Yeah. So different different chemical imbalances in your body can also have an effect on the hair follicles and hair growth, and that's why people who are trying to cure baldness are constantly looking for something that can stimulate those hair follicles to to produce hair again. Other thing, nails. So nails are also skin derivatives, epithelial derivatives. They grow very similar to a hair from a matrix, except this matrix is a nail matrix. It pushes its way out to the surface of your skin. This is going to help you <coughs> scratch yourself. <laughs> and that's actually in the book. I'm not kidding. And pick things up. The free edge of the nail, all that stuff you see, at the end, dead. The living stuff close to that matrix 
That fold of the nail is called the eponychium cuticle, where the nail pushes its way out onto the nail bed. <coughs> Excuse me. Those are skin derivatives. Um, other things are different glands that we're going to find in the dermis region. I want you to pay close attention when you look at your slides in lab to find the two very important glands found in the dermis associated with the integumentary system. One is going to help hairs grow by sort of lubricating that hair shaft, allowing cells to push out. That's called the sebaceous gland. So when you look at your slide and you look at the scalp, go find a hair follicle. Then go look for the thing that's hanging off of it. And that is a sebaceous gland. And the sebaceous gland produces what? Oils. That's also controlled by hormones. So when I was young, if I didn't get up immediately and wash my hair, I would look like the oil slick. Yes? Now that I'm old, I don't have to worry about that anymore. Everything's kind of drawn up, including my hair and my skin. Yes? Sebaceous glands. So spacious glands produce oils to help lubricate, also help with the waterproofing process. The other gland I'm going to talk about is the what? Sudoriferous gland. Give me another unfancy name for sudoriferous secretion. Sweat. Combination of sweat and sebaceous secretions produce something called your acid mantle. And this is going to provide chemical protection for you. Chemical protection from foreign invaders like nasty little critters, bacteria on the surface of your skin. So not only is the integumentary system a physical barrier, but it provides a chemical barrier for us as well. They talk about some different types of sweat glands, ecrine sweat glands. They're going to produce their product way down in that group of glandular material, which is epithelial cells, and squirt it out a tube to the what? Look at the diagram. Ecrine sweat. It looks like a pile of hose. And then one of the little hoses goes where? To the surface. So this also is going to help me regulate body temperature. Because water has a high heat of vaporization level. Right? All right. So when I sweat on the surface of my skin and it evaporates, it's going to help cool me down. We also have apocrine sweat glands. Those are kind of the stinky ones in little, little stinky areas of my integumentary system, in the genital regions or under your armpits. And then they talk about some modified sweat glands. One's called the ceruminous gland. And you know where those are? That's the nasty earwax that you produce. What's that for? Collect dust? Somebody's got the hiccups. Actually, it's so little critters won't do what? Crawl into the space. Yes. There's also hairs in there. They're going to help with that, too. And that's another thing that goes out of control when you get older. Right? Eyebrows, facial hair, ear hair. Whew. Things to look forward to as you get older. <laughs> and then mammary glands are also in the same category of modified sudoriferous glands. Um, they talk about some homeostatic imbalances. When we overproduce, sometimes things get caught up. Um, and cause pustules, seborrhea, and psoriasis, problems with skin. Blackheads can be produced as well. So understand the functions of the integumentary system. Understand the chemical barrier, the physical barrier. 
biological barrier. And that's going to include some of the cells in the epidermis that are going to help protect you from foreign invaders. We have cells down there that are going to protect you from foreign substances. This is your outside protection from the outside world. We have cells called Langerhans cells down in lower regions of the skin that are part of the integumentary, um, excuse me, part of the, my brain just went dead, <coughs> immune system. There it is. Begins with an I. Helps to regulate body temperature by increasing muscle contractions or those blood vessels can move closer to the surface or further away from the surface, surface excuse me, to help regulate body temperature. We also have nerve endings associated with hair follicles and the epidermis that are going to help with cutaneous <coughs> Excuse me, feeling, touch, temperature, pressure. Quite the blood reservoir associated with your skin. According to the textbook, 5% of your body's entire blood volume can be found in your skin. We're going to excrete waste products here as well. So the sebaceous and the sudoriferous excretions will also be waste product excretions as well. They talk about skin cancer. Basal cell, if you want skin cancer, if you have to have skin cancer, I told you today, you have to have it. Which one would you want? Basal cell. Okay, basal cell, that's the beginning, very least of the malignancies associated with this type. In most of the cases, about 80% is basal cell. Easy to remove. You see something weird starting to grow on your skin? Out of the ordinary, go get it checked out. Most of the time it's usually basal cell. I get rid of it, it's gone, we're good. What's next in line? Squamous cell. When the cells start to get a little bit more aggressive, still not as bad as the other nasty little guy called the melanoma, but we want to get rid of that as well. And then last but not least, the melanoma. Melanoma, um, melanomas can kill you. Yes, they spread very rapidly. And what are the A, B, C, D rules for these nasty little darker spots? And usually um, what happens is sometimes you have a darker spot on your skin. It's just a, it's just a place where you just produce a little bit more melanin than everywhere else. Keep an eye on it. Follow the ABCD rules. If it starts to change, it should be asymmetric, which means when I cut it in half, it looks the same on both sides. If it starts to get all jiggy and weird, go get it checked out. If the border starts to become irregular, jiggy and weird, go get it checked out. The color should be uniform. If it starts to change, I get darker blotches and lighter blotches. Go get it checked out. And if it starts to grow in diameter, go get it checked out. Don't wait. Burns. This diagram on page 165 shows us the extent of burns. We have first degree, second degree, and third degree burns. First degree would be the least amount of tissue destroyed, usually associated with the epithelial layers. Second degree deeper down, third degree deeper down. We can cause all sorts of problems. They talk about treating burns, first, second, and third, and we're done with chapter five. Told you I'd do it. So, um, one, one, uh, let's do one uh, clicker question. Principal role of melanin. I like this one. I'm not going to give you a set question. No. I've decided no. I'm not going to give you essay questions on your exam. I decided I don't want to correct them. <clears throat> but you need to know 
the sliding filament theory. Understand? Know the steps. Five, four, three, two, one. What's the answer? Shield the nucleus from damage, not to give you that healthy look. All right, so pay attention in lab. Your test is on Thursday. On Tuesday of next week, we'll have a clicker extravaganza. And then Thursday of next week, your final exam. One minute. Uh.